the Baltic Way. It was a protest flash mob that happened in 1989, one of the biggest the world has ever seen. The idea was to open the world's eyes to the ugly truth. The Baltic states were occupied after an evil secret pact between Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany to show that three Baltic nations didn't want to live under occupational power with crazy ideology, hopeless economy and polluted nature. The most surprising thing was that this flash mob actually happened. Two million people joined hands and stretched over three countries. Even more, there was not one burning tire, not one broken window, demolished shop or police car, nor fight. It's not like we couldn't get crazy, but we decided not to. And this peaceful protest was a success. They say, at one point, when the communist leaders saw this line of people on TV, Gorbachev said, See, we've lost them. We'll never get them back. You know what? He was right. Wish for something, join hands, and ta-da! Baltic Way was like Coelho's quote, but in real life. So, if that worked so well, why use it only once? Why not solve more problems the Baltic Way? Like, try to make some habit changes instead of climate changes. Protest against rudeness and bigotry. Challenge laziness and indifference. Stand against inequality and the hardships it causes. We're against forgetting our awesome traditions. We can even confront the biggest powers, such as loneliness. And do it not with hate, but with hope. Not with violence, but with confidence. Not dividing, but uniting. The Baltic Way. <laughs> Something for the history books. Right. That was. That's good. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's a first. Very good. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Rosie Goldsmith, and um, I'm going to introduce you to this amazing panel in one second. I'm just going to check that we've all got, we're all plugged in, so to speak. And the guys at the back, by the way, are running an amazing show. They're just two of them. They're filming everything. So if no, if people couldn't get here to see this, they can still see the film afterwards. And I think we're good to go. Excellent. Um, to judge by that film, it looks as though the Baltic Way can solve all our problems. Now, wouldn't that be great? Um, <laughs> I would like to, um, to welcome you all to this wonderful conversation we're going to have because we've got, um, we're going to, as Larry says, look back, but also stay very much in the present and then look forward another 30 years because I want to know what is the Baltic Way. And I want to know what acting the Baltic way actually means, and I want to know whether we should all be a bit Baltic. Um, and I think maybe we should. And I'd like you to meet three inspirational, eloquent, and very gifted individuals who live, breathe, and probably sleep the Baltic way. Um, maybe not in the Baltics, but we'll find out more about that. There are a few nomads here as well. But um, these three people represent all three countries of the Baltics. So first of all, Cardi Kenk is next to me. Cardi's a campaigner, an activist, and an environmentalist primarily. She has organized some extraordinary world events, such as World Cleanup Day, and we're going to hear all about her efforts. And then next to her is Monica Biliscate, who was born in Lithuania, but actually lives all over the world. She calls herself a digital nomad. And Monica is a futurist, and if you don't know what a futurist is, you will hear tonight, and she is an exceptional futurist. 
And um, at the end, we we're representing Latvia, <laughs> we have Pauls Raudseps, and Pauls um, lives in Riga, but was born in the United States, so he's the diaspora as such. And I'm already going to say that Pauls and I were both journalists, and Pauls started up some very important um, newspapers, magazines um, in um, Latvia, and is managing director and commentator for the weekly, the Latvian weekly, which is called IA. And we're going to talk about all these issues, future technologies, um, we're going to talk about the environment, and pretty much everything. We're going to try and solve all the problems of the world by the end of this evening. Now, but um, as Larry has already been ageist, I'm going to be ageist <laughs> as well. And I'm going to say that Pauls, <laughs> Pauls, Rautsips and I are probably the only two people on this stage who actually remember the Baltic Way 30 years ago. Because Monica, you were three? Something like but that. I was there. You were there. My dad actually took me there. You were actually there. there. That's <laughs> right. Well, I know that you've been asking your parents also what actually happened, but we'll we'll ask you that too. And then you were two. you were two, lovely. And Pauls and I were. I had just started off at the BBC, and Pauls, you weren't actually there. I wasn't there now. But you know what went yeah, on. So we're going to give you a little bit of background first of all, just a very little bit, just to set set up the conversation. So, what actually happened? And why did it happen? Well, why did it happen? Uh, because the Baltic states had been occupied in, starting in 1940. And I think looking back on this event, but looking at it through the lens of today and trying to understand what we can take from this event, uh, specifically from the historical experience, I was thinking that you could sort of define that in three kind of uh, catchphrases. And the first one would be, we're all in this together. And that's really why this happened, why the three states could, the three societies, the three countries, could link hands across this 670 kilometers or whatever it was. Because it was immediately apparent to everybody in all three countries who wanted independence, who understood that the occupation in 1940 had been an Ill illegitimate, that it had happened to all of them and they had to work together to overcome that. Uh, there was a panel discussion in Riga uh, on the 23rd of August where Dinas Ivans, the leader of the Popular Front, which was the independence movement, uh, said that he and the uh, Landsbergis from Lithuania and Savisar from Estonia, who were the leaders of the respective uh, organizations in uh, their countries, they had come together at, after the first sort of opening that had been created by Gorbachev in 1987 and 88. They had come together and started talking about what they wanted to do. And the one thing that they said was, we lost our independence because we were divided, and that will never happen again. And that was where the initiative came for this. And I think that thinking about today in, that, in those terms, I think that this really, the sense that uh, we're all in this together, that we have to work together to overcome our problems is one of the things that we either have to recover or really have to think about very hard because if you don't have that sense, then it's very difficult to get this kind of mobilization. The second thing, uh, which is <laughs> tied to this long, long human chain is, uh, I think the catchphrase is get in line. Why a, cha why a human chain? Because, I mean well, I think this, uh, <laughs> I, if I, I'm not really sure where the idea came from. There had been a, something like it in the United States in 1986 called Hands Across America, uh, which was not very successful. And was, uh, if I, I think there's a Simpsons episode where they make fun, <laughs> where they make fun of it, actually. So, so uh, but so, somehow this idea got to get, but, but it's, it's it, yeah, I, I don't really know where the idea, the idea came from. Every, people have different versions, but, the, but this, this strong sense of solidarity, but I think what's very important, and here I'm going to quibble a little bit I, with this very, I, I like the video a great deal, but I think there's one word that's not quite accurate where they said it was a flash mob, and that is not something that this was, because a flash mob is something where something, you know, you throw something on Facebook or Twitter and say, okay, everybody, you know, come together in Trafalgar Square tomorrow at 12, and, and the people who show up don't even know each other, and then they disappear into the crowd and they never meet again, right? And that's not what this was. This was 
incredibly organized. You had people sitting in Riga and Vilnius and Tallinn going, okay, the people from this little town are gonna to go to this portion of the highway and the people from this little town are gonna to go to this portion of the highway and this is where you're gonna get the buses and these are the people who are gonna make sure that it happens. And I think that's also a very important lesson to take away from this is that you don't get uh, social and political change unless you have organization and unless you have leaders who are trusted and who can invite people, mobilize them, represent them, and have an organization that carries this on. Because this was not the first, I mean, this was not the last great demonstration. There, in Latvia, we, uh, there were large demonstrations afterwards where hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people participated. And eventually, independence was achieved in all three countries because there was organization, because there were these trusted leaders who were, who were able to represent But the it was, opposite. compared with what was happening in the rest yeah. of Eastern Europe, it was remarkably organized. Because, yes. And previous to that, you'd had the, the um, singing revolutions, which of course everybody thought was you know, incredible and wonderful, and who'd ever mm -hmm. heard of you know, something as, as wonderful and positive as mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering, what did you, even though you were very young, I know that you've talked to parents and friends and so on too, but what do you... Were you t are you taught about it in school? And what did you learn about the, the Baltic way? Cardi? In the school, it's just something fun to remember. They show it with movies that have songs that are sang in all the three different languages, and it's all very fun. I think I didn't really understand the meaning of it until I myself became an activist and started to realize what it really means to try to join hands or mobilize and why it can be so completely like, complicated. Because now also having organized something very big, first a nationwide cleanup campaign, now a worldwide cleanup campaign, saying, yes, cool, 20 million people participated, it feels like it was a simple thing to do. People have been working really hard to achieve this, and you can see what are the struggles behind it. Well, 20 million in the cleanup campaign, yes. and 2 million in, two, in, the, in the book. Yes, and then 2 million in the, in the Baltic way, uh, that until it really happens, no one really knows whether it's going to really be a success, mm -hmm. right? You do, you do your best, you prepare, and you do all this preparation, which is really necessary, unless you do that, you really mm -hmm. won't get anywhere, anywhere, right? It, it's not a flash mob. People just don't appear and want to do this. You need somebody who's crazy enough to believe that it can actually happen. And, and, uh, and for, for me, I think I started to appreciate it when we from Estonia started to promote the global action, then it's like a startup. You have to put something like as a resume that we are able to do something. And that's what we used. It's the Baltic way. We've done this before. We've mobilized our people. We've, we've been mobilizing internationally. It's not new for us. We're just proposing how about the whole world could be working together in the same wave, doing something together, ch changing something all together. Mm. So for, for, for us, it was definitely kind of an icebreaker how to introduce us to the world and show that something big can actually happen. I mean, that was the point, wasn't it, Pals? I know this is something that you've written about as well. The fact that the, the world actually looked at the Baltic states, at Latvia, Estonia um, and Lithuania for the first time almost. It's almost as though you hadn't existed before and suddenly there you were singing and holding hands and, you well, know, people it, remarkable. Had, people had noticed, I mean, first of all, there, uh, there were Baltic politicians, Baltic uh, cultural figures who were saying, you know, that we are not satisfied with our place in the Soviet Union, but it, w it wasn't entirely clear who they represented, whether they, re they represented anybody. And all of a sudden you have two million people come out and hold hands and you say, this is not just, you know, a couple, a handful of uh, extremists or, or odd people who are coming out and saying this. This is really whole societies who are demanding, demanding uh, that their history, what what happened to them uh, be recognized. And if you, it's interesting, if you look at the memoirs of particularly American statesmen of the time, uh, there were demonstrations in Latvia in 87, the F Popular Fronts were founded in 88, uh, there, there were a lot of Baltic politicians in Moscow saying that they wanted greater sovereignty, greater, uh, greater uh, control over what was happening in, the, in, the, in their countries. They didn't pay attention. But after this happened, everybody said, oh my god, this is really important. And then in a, fu in a funny way, Moscow actually uh, made that attention even 
uh, more important because they came out with a very harsh sta statement where they literally said uh, this event could threaten the existence of the Baltic nations. And I think that got a lot of people's attention mm -hmm. as well. Monica, what do your family, your parents remember? What do they talk? Do they talk about this? And when you go back to Lithuania, is it important to anybody in your family? Um, my family is because my, my father was never <laughs> pro regime, rather the contrary, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously put did, him was into he some part of the, the, the? Did he go out as part yeah, of the? Yeah, yeah. He, he he went out and he took me there, and obviously I was too little to have any clear recollections. Uh, so for him, it was very important. Um, but if I'm very honest, um, I don't remember being taught about it at school, nor I remember it being something referenced on any regular basis as I was growing up. Um, nor, to be honest, I feel that it led to the kind of collaboration that maybe should have led between the three Baltic countries. Mm. You know, I, I think it's really sad that you know, growing up, I mean, growing up, well, we were, you know, still it was hard to travel and stuff like that, but like right now, Lithu Lithuanians know more like they have more British friends, something like that, than they have Latvian friends. And I think there needs to be that stronger exchange that we could build upon, especially right now, you know, celebrating the 30 years. The point is like, well, we actually, you know, we give the meaning to the past without a future. Right, and so like, just the fact that we did something is never really good enough. It's like, what can we build upon that? And I think there needs to be more of the collaboration between the countries, between these countries' youth. Um, and you, and I know you've talked about nostalgia being poison in a way, being a bad thing. Yeah. You know, and it, it's wonderful to remember these events, but what can they instruct us in in the future? I know is one of the the areas that you. Can yeah, I think I think I think th that's the key. Seeing how you know some elements of the past, you know, can be the blueprints for the future. You know, by updating them, not just reproducing the same thing because every situation is radically different. Um, at the same time, how also certain elements of the past, you know, we need to understand and examine that history so we don't repeat those mistakes. And so it's powerful to see, you know, some of the inspiration of the Baltic Way then, you know, being used in Hong Kong and in other places right now. Um, but I think, you know, the Baltic countries do need to tell their story on a larger platform than they've been doing. Because I think what we, and I don't want to comment so much on Estonians and Latvians, but as a Lithuanian, um, even in the tech community, in the startup community, everybody complains that Lithuanians are really good at getting stuff done. But they don't necessarily have the right sort of front men and front women that, 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 that proudly go out there and actually represent and say that we're actually really good at this stuff. Mm. Well, you've got right? three, and not three, people, confidence is you've got three people on stage who, you know, all three of you are pretty remarkable at doing that. I mean, we'll, we'll get on to that because I think it's a really important point as to what extent, you know, you as Baltic states can work together more. Pals, I'm just going to ask you, first of all, you, you weren't in Latvia at the time, but you, you came back. Um, where, where were you on the, on the day, so and why did you come back to Latvia? It's interesting that you say come back, because that's, well, maybe, every, everybody maybe always says that. that and, but I was born in the United States, and so I didn't really, I, I mean... Did you feel I, Latvian? Yes, you, I certainly, well, I certainly did, Latvian because I, I spoke yeah. Latvian before I spoke English. I didn't, I, when I started going to school, I didn't speak English, although I was born in the States. And there was a small but very, very active uh, Latvian community uh, in, not all over the United States, but in a number of cities, including Boston, where I grew up. Uh, so emotionally, it's the right word, but, but obviously physically, it's not the right word. Uh, but uh, at the time, I was in New York, uh, and I remember the, the Central Committee statement, which I mentioned, threatening the Baltic states, that was on the front page of the New York Times. I remember that very, very distinctly because it was so upsetting to, to see that, and we were obviously very worried about what would happen. But uh, I moved to Latvia essentially in 1990 to work for the Popular Front, and then helped found a newspaper there and, and stayed. So you were there for independence? Yes, I was there for independence, and I was there for the coup in August. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
Well, look, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about what you all do now um, mm. in your respective countries, or not, you know, because you do move around, Monica moves around a lot. But uh, does that mean, though, Monica, because you do, you've been, work, you've been traveling for about 10 years, I think, of your life, as, as you call yourself a digital nomad, you must tell me what a digital nomad actually is, um, but does that mean you feel, do you feel any patriotism about Lithuania? Do you feel connected to Lithuania? I'm not sure how right the word patriotism is, and I'm not sure that you know patriotism is really helpful in anything in the world today. Because unfortunately, patriotism often like veers um, towards nationalism, um, and I don't believe in that. I think the issues that we face as humanity, we need to face them together, and we need to understand how interconnected we all are. Um, um, do I feel Lithuanian? Absolutely, I do. Do I feel just Lithuanian? No, I don't. Um, you know, my life has been influenced by all the places that I have lived, spent time in, worked in, have dear friends in, colleagues, peers, etc. Um, I would not be the person I am if I were born anywhere else but a Lithuania. And I would not be doing things that I do, understand things that I understand, you know, if I would have not gone, through, like my really my coming of age was really marked by the collapse of the physical walls and the opening up of the digital space. So simultaneously living through that possibility that physical walls can be crushed down and the world can open, you know, um, and um, and at the same time starting to have that access into the digital sphere where, well, we are truly all interconnected and there is no barrier. Um, and I think uh, another huge influence in my life, and I think I would not be where I am, uh, was my geography teacher. You know, and although she was born in the Soviet Union and she obviously could not travel outside of the Soviet Union, the way she t taught us about the world was really what rendered me curious about the world. And I remember that my father's dream at that time was to possibly one day go and visit Australia. Um, and, and she really made me want to go and visit the world to understand where the world is at. So um, I think it's, it's very important to see, to be proud of um, you know, what is your story, where you've come from. At the same time, remember that you have not chosen it. You know, we are born into places by luck. You know, Syrian people are born in Syria, you know, by chance. We were born in Lithuania or Latvia. Like, it's not like any personal achievement of our own, nor our ancestors' achievements, our own achievements. But do you, when you talk to your, um, your, your parents' generation, and, you know, and pals and our generation, if you like, that do you, do you see that what you're doing today, the freedom you have today, is very much because of what they did? And I mean, that's something which would make me feel very proud. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. Like, I'm, every day, um, I realize the massive difference between myself um, and my peers from who are not born into dictatorships, who are not born into autocratic regimes. And, and, and that, um, that disparity, um, um, I felt it very strongly with the American election, the last American election, where a lot of my very brilliant American peers, you know, could not believe that this could happen to them. Mm. So I mean, that's right? a really. And so good... I think the appreciation of freedom, appreciation to be able to go out and explore the world, and also to to be able to come back to your country, mm. because I do have a lot of friends who cannot go back to their countries, who have to live exile, who if they would go back to their countries would end up in prison, you know, tor tortured and possibly killed. So for me, that freedom that I gain, that I do not take for granted, is built upon the shoulders of everybody who worked towards Nicardi, it. Nikadi, as somebody in the same generation, is that any, pretty much the same age, do you feel that, um, do you feel an attachment to Estonia because of what Estonia went through? Or what, how would you define your attachment to your country? Well, if I'm abroad and I see somebody Estonian acting dis disrespectfully, I definitely feel ashamed because I identify with them because I feel that we are the same for some reason. I wouldn't feel that with a 
disrespectful Lithuanian probably the same. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very happy that I am Estonian at that moment. So I, I, I'm sure that it, these are the moments when you decide that mm. I am Estonian, when I, my, the father of my child is Dutch, when I registered him um, then I registered him as an Estonian baby, right? I make these decisions. So I do have to make decisions on what I am and how I identify myself. And when Hemingway says you can find an Estonian from any harbor in the world, then I am proud to be Estonian. I'm proud to, uh, to say that Skype was co-founded by Estonians. I feel good about that. I feel good that let's do it movement started from Estonia. But at the same time, of course, I identify with people who share my values. And that makes me also feel good with Latvians or Lithuanians and our shared past makes us feel stronger. So we have a big movement and global environmental movement that can bond anyone, me with an Indonesian or a Chinese or somebody from Fiji. But there is something that makes us even stronger because of our shared past. I wonder also with the environment, with the, the climate change um, you know, crisis that's going on at the moment and what you're doing, and in a way what you're all involved in, which is sort of global movements, whether it's media or um, you know, future technologies and entertainment and with the, um, uh, the clean-up campaigns, is whether because you come from the Baltics, which are countries which are extremely beautiful, covered with a lot of nature and woodland, and so on, whether you feel even more motivated because of what you've got to protect. It's a sm these are small countries doing big things. I know we've used this as a hashtag, you know, small nations, big impact, but it's true. Definitely what small nations probably don't feel are the boundaries that the big world could set for themselves. I mean, we don't see them because in our case, the president could be the, you know, ex-boyfriend of your mother or something. You know? <laughs> it's possible. And they usually are. <laughs> possibly. Possibly. So, so, I mean, you, don't, you, you just don't create already those Chinese walls between I will never be able to do that because look at who I am or where I am. You always feel closer to being the one making change happen. Maybe a bit naively, but it's mm. proven us to be rather successful about it. But also, I think because you come from smaller communities, I think there's a greater sense of responsibility because you can't, I mean, everybody, I don't know if everybody, but a lot of people feel that you're, you know, if, if I don't do this, nobody's going to do it because there just aren't that many of us, right? Mm. So everybody has to take part in some way. So, I mean, as far as the size goes, you're, you're the smallest. Yeah. Yep. And then, then Latvia mm -hmm. and then Lithuania. <laughs> so, are we si we're ageist? Are we sizist as well? I mean, do you care about how, s I mean, does it matter to you how small your countries are? Or do you sort of feel, you know, punch above your weight? It's very funny. So, I mean, obviously, I, I, I travel a bit all over the place, and when um, I tell people where I'm from, and they're like, well, how many inhabitants? And then they're like, oh, it's like uh, one little area in Tehran. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but um, I think what's interesting is when you come from very small places, at a very early age, you realize that the world is not really going to come to you. You have to go to the world. You have to speak the languages of the world. You have to understand the world. You can't e expect the world to adapt to you. And I see that all the time with, you know, whatever, French tourists anywhere or expats anywhere mm -hmm. where they go and they'll just expect to make that little France in Shanghai or, you know, um, Thailand or wherever they are. Um, whereas I think we just realize that, well, it is for us to, mm -hmm. you know, it's for us to understand, it's for us to adapt. And that is actually a good thing because the future is about adaptability. And learning everybody else's languages too. Absolutely. I mean, the English is just incredible as well. That's one, one, of the, one of the things that strikes you immediately. You can have conversations with anybody from, um, from any of your countries in English without, without problems. Um, Pals, what, what are the, if you like, going, looking at those 30 years ago, what are the values that were established by the Baltic Way, which in a way, you know, have sort of pushed the three countries forward and made them into these, you know, I know there have been the bumpy mm -hmm. stages of the economies and so on too for all of them, but let's not go over, you know, the old ground. I really want to try and define what the values are that these countries establish as a result of the Baltic Way. Well, I think what, uh, one thing is cooperation. I, th I you know, I, everybody, and I hear this in Latvia as well, you know, we used to be so unified and now that's not the case anymore. 
in fact, in a historical perspective, the Baltic states are not, the cooperation between the Baltic states now is at a level that it's never been in the history of these countries, certainly not between the wars when they were independent, when they basically partly traded with each other, when the, when the security and diplomatic cooperation was very sporadic and, and not really very effective. Uh, we see incredible economic cooperation, which also leads to, I, think, I mean, I know journalists in Lithuania, I know journalists in Estonia, we cooperate with them, we, you know, they write articles for us, we write articles for them. So in the professional field, if you are active, then you will know people in all three states and you will, and you will work with them. Uh, and there are big projects that are being uh, planned and uh, even, well, will soon be built. Uh, one is uh, the Rail Baltica, the high-speed rail line from Tallinn to... That's well, been one of the, the yeah, big yeah. problems, there's been no link, rail Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, it it there will be a, a side branch to Vilnius, so it won't be quite this route of the Baltic <laughs> way, but it's close enough, right? And um, also the desynchronization of our electricity grids from Russia and, and synchronous, which is a huge project, very expensive, very and and which is all, we're also all doing together. Uh, the whole energy policy, maybe the coordination could have been a bit better, but but still, that's something that that all three Baltic states. What about are security together. and military? Yeah, and security uh, cooperation is very strong. So, and as I said, and the, but the main thing is, if you look at, for instance, uh, trade data, uh, Estonia and Lithuania are Latvia's main trading partners. Right, which, as I said, between the wars, that was not the case. And that was also not the case in the Soviet period because everything was very centralized. Everything was sent to Moscow and redistributed through the whole Soviet Union. And in fact, the Soviets worked very hard to make sure that the three Baltic states wouldn't cooperate because they, because they also sort of sensed that there was something there that they didn't really want to encourage. And it has only been 30 years. Yes. You yeah, think it, that's yeah. not actually very long yeah, at all. Yeah. Um, so, so, so those values, if you like, those are some of the more um, the, the pragmatic ways mm -hmm. that, of cooperation. Um, and of course, membership of the EU, mm -hmm. OECD, NATO, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but what about the, the values? You spoke about you know, acting collectively, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Are there any things that you could pick up there from even just what we've seen or what you've heard about the Baltic way that you think is, is something that you can, you know, that you're able to use in your work? Oh, completely. I would say that um, one reason why Let's Do It movement and World Cleanup Day even grew up was we live in a beautiful country that is covered, half of it is covered in forest. It's a beautiful country, but it was covered in trash. And people were used to bringing their trash to the forest. There was I would say people had lost the sense of ownership to their communities or their sense of responsibility. And uh, we saw that the only way to regain that was to, again, mobilize people to do something together. It wasn't about let's raise enough money to clean it all up. It's about, look, guys, you all can participate in changing something and bringing back that positive um, success experience and cooperation experience that this can actually happen now again. And I suppose at the time when we were doing it for the first time, I mean, people had not been used to that because it was a new age. Uh, in the time of the regained independence, people hadn't done anything of that size before because it had all passed. The reason to fight together would, had passed, right? We were free. Now we were all out, out looking into the, out in the world and who cares about the Latvians and Lithuanians? They're all struggling their own fights. You know, we're like triplets. We're very close together. We're born together, but everybody has their own interests and ways of wanting to show off in the world. So it kind of brought us together that uh, definitely that self-worth of, and that has now needed to be reinforced again. And we shouldn't forget that, that sense that we can be seen in the world. We can be, you know, noticed, because that identity was taken away from us. We didn't own anything. We couldn't be the Olympic winner of Estonia. You, were, you, you just couldn't do that, right? So now that feeling of fighting for something and being seen in the world, it was proven. And, you know, it can be now shown in any example, whether it's um, the Baltic Way or if it's the song festivals or <laughs> stupid things like Eurovision. I mean, it's great to be seen and noticed in the world, right? So, and maybe now why not, you know, picking up trash altogether, showing that we so what? But what started you off on that? Because, I mean, this, it's incredible what you've achieved. Absolutely incredible. And you've just this past weekend had World Cleanup Day. It's the second year. Second year. Second yeah. year you've done it. And how many countries were involved? Uh, 168. 68 countries and so it's one day 
and everybody goes out for five hours or something like that, a day if possible, and cleans up trash, yes. as we call it, rubbish. Um, but so, and how many tons of rubbish can you clean up across, you know, across the world in that time? We're still time? collecting data about this year, but last year we collected 88,000 tons of trash. Uh, with the help of 17.8 million people when the first, uh, first action took place. And um, it, it's, it's something that, um, let's say, it is pointing to another problem that we are having that, of it's course... It's where do you put the trash. Yeah, yeah, yes, and, and with, uh, you know, that the fact that yeah. th that amount of trash is only half that's generated in Indonesia in half a day. Um, but it's rather about showing that, look, guys, the individual can only do that much. <gasps> Um, we need cooperation from all sectors of society in order to change that problem. And it all starts from not pointing fingers. The difference from that civil action that we're doing right now from maybe the Baltic way was that there was a certain um, bad guy, the antagonist, the somebody that we were up against. Now what we are doing with waste is saying that there's a huge problem that all of us can solve as consumers. Politicians need to adopt more sustainable politics. Uh, um, the ent entrepreneurs have to be more forward thinking and sustainable. But that cannot be done by us standing up and pointing fingers who's to blame, who created the problem. And the cleanup action is something where in the, in the spirit of cooperation, we're saying that let's try and find something that we all agree upon. And we all agree that living in a green and healthy environment, I mean, in clean space, we actually prefer that to anything else. Let's clean stuff up together. And then all of a sudden, people who might not even like each other come behind the same table and maybe then develop a conversation. Why did it happen? Uh, let's be calm and talk about it. What can each and every one of us do more? Mm -hmm. And that gives, um, the, the, it has so much more impact than just trash or nature, because here, all of a sudden, civil society is taken seriously by politicians. The fear of maybe they're going to start a new political party is not so imminent anymore. It's rather about we can collaborate with them. They have a role to play to support us. Politicians can support, they are not all bad and corrupt, they're actually just out there using their tools and enterprises the same way, that they're not just after profit, if they could co cooperate, everybody could uh, try to do better. I mean, in a way, what you're doing is kind of the embodiment of the, the Baltic way. I mean, it's, it's, it's really inspirational, but I'm just wondering also, I mean, you're talking about local, it's, it's getting people mobilized locally, but for an, a massive global project. So it is very much, I suppose, what you know, the Baltic Way was about. And it's very similar to what you're doing as well. You're working very closely with lots of different people on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, you've got to explain what a futurist is, because it's not about going around living the glamorous life. It's actually going down, getting your hands dirty mm -hmm. in lots and lots of different countries. So local, and then but with a big global message, if you like, for dare I say, for humanity, so which is pretty much, again, what the Baltic Way was about. So tell us what you're doing and what, yeah, so, um, what, what futurists Yeah, so I'm, do. I'm, I'm futurist researcher, futurist and futurist designer. Um, as a futurist researcher, I go around the world, um, literally everywhere, nine, 90 countries by now, um, and not just like one time for a few days, but spending time. Um, and I try to understand um, where and how a future emerges. Um, so where and how the future emerges? Okay. Um, it's, it's a very different, um, the way I do it is very different from sort of Silicon Valley futurists who many of them have their own narrative arc. They have their own idea of the future that they want to see and then they go around preaching it. It's almost like <laughs> a new form of theology, like tech theology. Um, and most of the time it involves saying that technology is going to save us all and we don't need to really tackle any societal issues. Um, you know, my um, way of working is very different. It's really about going and really finding who is truly at the bleeding edge. You know, who are people living that change today? Um, in how, so you know, not the how cutting edge, but the bleeding edge. The bleeding edge, yeah, the okay. bleeding edge. Um, so it's really th that edge completely out there. Yeah. The cutting edge is like something that we understand. Oh, this is the most innovative thing today. The bleeding edge is what most people are even not aware of, right? And how that bleeding edge. And, and what is really at, at that edge of emergence interacts with the existing powers. You know, that either participate in a change, but from that very ossified structure, um, or oppose the change. And how that interaction leads towards whatever that will be. Um, I'm specifically focused on how 
um, technological and scientific innovation affects politics and culture, but also in turn how our cultural background and political reality affects the kind of innovation that we do to start with. Um, some things are obvious, you know, how like different science fiction stories affected, you know, Google wanting to tick off specific technologies, yet forgetting entirely bigger humanitarian questions. Um, so it's about making the future, um, creating future technologies um, for human beings, in other words, making sure that they, yeah. that they have a social, cultural... Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's not, for me it is, absolutely, but it's not what really happens. Right? So it's very important to see how popular narratives affect the kind of innovation that we do, the kind of innovation that we don't really do, we push down our priority list, we don't think that that's very innovative, and then the kind of innovation that we don't think we could or should be doing. Right? And so examining those myths is incredibly important. So seeing what is that relationship between science and tech, and then politics and culture. Give us an example, because um, I think that would be really helpful if you've got you know, an example that totally. you're, say you're working on at the moment. Um, and, uh, and also, just to be clear, you, you're, not, you're not talking about creating utopias. Um, yeah. You're not talking about um, being anti-dystopia, because of course all we talk about is dystopia and utopia, and it seems to be pretty much set in those ways. You've got a completely new description of what yeah. you're trying to create. Yeah, so I feel, um, again, we always start with a narrative. Um, and so a story. what, what a story. art originally was, what art sort of historically was, is a means for us to understand the world and tell the stories of the world and prepare you know, our future generations for whatever world is to come. Today, unfortunately, art has become a bunch of random stuff in wide boxes that doesn't really add or expand not all of it art, of course, but a lot of the art does not really expand um, our potential as human beings. Um, so when it comes to these narratives, um, you know, I am not just futurist researcher and futurist. As a futurist, I go and consult media companies, tech companies, cities, countries, governments, and help them understand where the future is going, helping them see how they could participate in it in a more positive manner, um, how they could be the change that we want to see uh, but as futures designer, I also have worked a lot, predominantly with Hollywood, in designing what future worlds look like in science fiction entertainment properties. And then through these two areas, through my work with sort of very real tech, very real sort of policy and social issues, and also working on these like grand elaborate fictions that we so love to watch, um, you know, I've really come to realize that dystopia narratives and no more caution tales. They don't warn us about anything anymore. They become product roadmaps. We look at it and we think that, well, that future is somewhat inevitable. So we don't need and to worry about it. So in a way, like, it becomes a desperate escapism. We're like, well, it's all fucked. So like, there's nothing we can do about it. So let's just not do anything about it. Let's just eat more popcorn. Right? And, but we don't believe utopian narratives anymore because we've seen them fail. Right? And then Soviet Union, peddle that utopian narrative towards us as well, and we've seen it fail. Because past utopias have rarely been contextual, have rarely been inclusive. They've been very top down. And you mentioned the Soviet Union, because of course that was part of the narrative of the Soviet Union. It was the Absolutely. Soviet Absolutely, like the perfect society, right? And we've seen these ideas of perfection and perfect future fail time and time again. And we've seen these cities that were built very top down, you know, Brasilia and the like, to not become inhabited, right, and to crumble apart. Um, and so what I've been really working on right now, and I'm even working on a TV show, a documentary TV series called Protopia, and the term Protopia has been coined by Kevin Kelly, the founding editor of Wired Magazine in 2011, um, but I'm taking it into new space. You know, his so it's idea- prototype, prototype. Protopia. Uh, so Protopia originally, like he he was inspired to create that word from the word pronoia, which is the opposite of paranoia. Which you know, is, you know, instead of thinking the whole world is against me, thinking the whole world is rooting for me. Um, but it rhymes perfectly with prototype, proactive, progress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and what Protopia for me is, it is a better, evolved future where we've come together imperfect as our condition is. So it's not trying to leapfrog and say, oh, we solved everything. And it is saying we have 
this is a vision of a future that we can show where we have solved the issues that we know that we can solve. It is a proactive vision, it's an inspiring vision. It is a vision where we're still dealing with our failures as humanity, as a planetary species, but it can serve us as a blueprint, as a guide. And I think that's what we actually need today. And we need that not just in an entertainment space, we absolutely, more than anything, need that in a policy making space. Because it is very hard to make people believe in any kind of unpopular policies. It's very hard to make people change their values if they don't understand what is the bigger picture that they're playing into, right? And so that proactive, better vision of the future where we understand what is really at stake and what are the possible solutions and where our protagonists are not sort of fictional, you know, cape wearing superheroes, but people who are the change makers of today can help us to then decide better upon the choices that we are facing in the present moment. And talking about blueprints and future, I mean, that is, you know, exactly how to move the conversation on to, to talk about, you know, what, what is the future of the, the Baltic Way? Is there a future um, which is very specifically Baltic, a Baltic way? Is there, a, is there a Baltic toolkit for the future? Because when you hear um, people like Monica and Cardi talk, I mean, it's fantastic, you and I of a certain generation, um, the freedom, if you like. I, I, mean, I think it's fantastic, the things you're doing. But we go back and we can remember the, the propaganda of the Soviet times. We can remember the, you know, those particular you know, times. And I'm just wondering what is actually happening in the media and entertainment <coughs> Um, industry itself in the Baltic states, or in, in Latvia in particular, in your case, is it hopeful? Is it a good time for media? <laughs> well, what's happening in Latvia is the same thing that's happening everywhere. I think that you see the internet destroying a lot of traditional media. You see uh, people searching for new business models, which are not that easy to find. I think the one thing that I take from my experience, and which I, is not directly influenced by the Baltic way, but I think it's all part of that, that general movement. Uh, well, let me step back a moment. The the point of the Baltic Way. What I mean, it, we mentioned independence movement and so forth. But in fact, there was one very concrete goal, and that was for the Soviet Union to recognize one truth, which it was truth. 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 It that was word, truth. truth. They were. They. It was that the Soviet Union was being asked. Actually, that we were demanding that the Soviet Union recognized that in 1939, Hitler and Stalin signed the secret protocol, which basically gave the Baltic states to the Soviet Union and allowed the Soviet Union to occupy us, which the Soviet Union had denied up, and, up, until, up until that point. And this demand for truth was incredibly powerful throughout the whole independence movement. I mean, it was, it, all the things that happened basically were an outgrowth of people starting to say yes, but there were deportations. There was there was the KGB repressions. There was all the there was the occupation. There were all these things that happened. We have to start talking about these. And as soon as this truth started coming out, the political implications of that were unavoidable, right? And what I do today in the media, not as influentially as the <laughs> way, but is to try in our own you know to, imperfect way as much as we can to talk about what is true today. And I think that this is, uh, it's much more difficult today in a lot of ways than it was back then because we are so mediated through the internet. I think the fact that people could come together and actually hold hands is, is not directly related to the truth, but in a way it is because truth has to be instantiated. It has to, it has to appear through social connections. It doesn't appear just because you're looking at a, a screen. The screen is why we get all this, all this fake news and stuff like that, because you, have, you don't have that kind of social uh, direct uh, contact, which I think creates social truth, which people can then act on. And I think that, that's a big problem. And I don't really have an answer for that. I don't think any of us really do. But I think that's, uh, that's not a particularly Baltic problem. But how do you find, um, I mean, for instance, for young journalists, people who want to become journalists yeah. in Latvia, I mean, these are, are there you know, media studies groups, are there colleges, which is, you know, I know you, you were also um, head of an ethics committee, a journal yeah. for the, um, the National Union of mm -hmm. Journalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there an awareness of the ethics of journalism, of the kind of, dare I say, the, you know, the BBC 
um, journalism, which I learned uh, mm -hmm. myself, which I was part of for 20 years? There is, definitely. And I think this, this is one of the... Uh, when uh, I was involved in founding Diana, which was the leading newspaper in Latvia for very many years, I think one of the one of the contributions that we made to journalism at the time was that we were one of the first to really codify a code of ethics for our journalists. Mm -hmm. And that uh, has had, I think, a, real, a really very powerful influence on the journalistic community in Latvia as a whole. Uh, we have very, a lot of very strong journalists, a lot of who came through this newspaper, uh, who now work as, as investigative journalists in various other uh, TV and radio and, and other publications in our own publication. And uh, it's, it's been a very a crucial aspect in Latvian politics and Latvian development that we have this strong journalistic community. And I think that's very, still very important. And the fact that, as I said, on the one hand, I said, okay, we have this, all the same problems that media has all over, all over the place. But on the other hand, uh, I can say that I feel very lucky because I work for a print weekly magazine, a serious print weekly magazine that does a lot of uh, reporting on politics, investigative reporting on economics and so forth, the kind of magazine that's really struggling in a lot of places today. We are making ends meet. When we were forced to leave Diana because it had been sold to people that we didn't want to work for, uh, we were able to raise money in 2009, which was not a great year for Latvia. <laughs> As the or anyone. Min <laughs> yeah, exactly. We were able to raise enough money to, to launch that publication in 2010, and, uh, and we're still around. Well, maybe there's something you can teach all of us, you yeah. know. Monica. Um, with all due respect. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to get an argument here. That's good. <laughs> so we've got to get into an argument to yeah. animate this whole thing. Here we go. Um, I have to disagree. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know saying that social media is not real and screen is not real. Well, I don't it's think you a said bit of a that, did you? I mean, you didn't say social. I'm not media saying it's not real. real. I just think that it's it's the the, the context makes it much more difficult to establish a co sort of a uh, a common understanding of what we accept to be true that can also be tested and refined through 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 various things because you're just constantly being thrown and you know you're just in this wave of information well I mean and let's yeah. not, let's not talk about things yeah. that aren't okay. related yeah. to politics yeah. okay. yeah. as such yeah. because yeah. I do want yeah. to try and make it relevant to, to, yeah. to a topic. But I think this is a very important point because I think that's this is a very very common misconception um, and as I said you know in my own life the opening up of the digital world was truly the crucial thing that that allowed me to be where I am and to do the kind of work that I do, um, which is truly extraordinary and exceeds you know the expectations of all of the generations um, and my family, my country that, that came before. Um, and I think it is true that it is important to come together physically at some point, right? And that's what you know you do, but we absolutely you know, the emerging new generation, we absolutely use digital tools to connect people and to cross those boundaries and collapse the walls that were absolutely impossible to collapse before in any analog world, right? So the issue is not the digital space. The issue is not the screen. The issue is that it is just a tool and it's how we use it. And if we just dismiss it and say, oh, well, this is not real and this is not good enough or whatever before it used to be better, we fall into that trap of nostalgia. And nostalgia is absolute poison. We need to discuss how do we use these things in a present day to connect people in a way that the Baltic way you know, can not just span 500 kilometers, can span the entire world, mm -hmm. and can span communities that, and people, you know, who are much more marginalized. You know, growing up in a small town, North Lithuania, called Chole, I definitely felt like a black sheep. And it is through the digital access that I was able to find like-minded people across the world. And that is absolutely what we need to do. And so we need to have a proactive conversation of how are we using these tools to not divide us, but to connect us. And that really feeds into what you're doing as well, too. I mean, how do you mobilize people? Because if you just think of what it meant 30 years ago to get 2 million people to join us without mobile phones, without, I don't even know how they did it. I mean, I know that you know people. There were, you know, it was organised, but you know, how 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 you know how do you use the tools that you now have 
Um, first of all, of, I, I, this is not the conversation about whether social media is good or bad or <coughs> definitely as a remark, without social media, something like this could never have happened. We had 130 billion impressions last year um, that resulted in such great numbers of volunteers coming out. And is that, where is that, on, on Facebook, on... on it, social media, that, social that, media. that covers all, all the, the, platforms. the platforms. Yeah. And um, that, that's all very great, but uh, if I come back closer to home, then um, I would still say that uh, Globally works. I mean, it's great because journalism is not always free. And I mean, in some places, they don't even show up on a press conference unless they know they get food. In other places, they will never write about you unless you pay them, right? <laughs> True story. True story. Been there. Well, yes. <laughs> how, how are you, right? Not a lot yet, but We just get water, you know. <laughs> so, uh, there's wine after. I don't yeah. know if you would have come otherwise, right? So, um, <laughs> The, the hard to prove the point. So, um, but but it's actually funny still to. I mean, we don't have much self worth when it comes to covering ourselves as good examples in the world. So I'll bring you an example. The Stuart Foundation developed an AI tool that's able to detect trash from any video or uh, photo imagery. Um, great tool. I have a friend who I met throughout this movement when campaigning a foreign Estonian who lives in the U.S. So who is a big data scientist with Google. And he became very fascinated with my story, and he covered our story in Forbes. He wrote about what I do in Forbes. He asks me, uh, up, you know, updates about what, what are we up to. Because he wrote that story in Forbes, then a Finnish um, news station picked up the story and wrote their story about this, which then, in turn, made an Estonian news um, um, agent to contact us and say, hey, you seem to be doing something cool. Tell us about it, too. And you're like, damn, you're my neighbor. Why couldn't you just find it's important to talk about it and make us bigger already? But it has to go through, OK, if everybody else recognized you, then it's safe for us to boost you as well. And um, it's... it's um, I think it's it's a syndrome that we have. I don't. Think I think I think all countries do to a certain degree that you know if something happens, if some, if you're recognised from outside, then suddenly oh yes now now we can take them yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Now you know. we can take them seriously. Yeah. But but in fact, I mean, last year our goal was to get 380 million people to go out clean trash. We realised that we reported it was 17.5 people didn't take us seriously because they thought this is too big. A country that has 1.3 million people just cannot grasp the number of 17 million people. What does that mean? <laughs> but where are they? Who are they? Who go out and clean? Because that's a huge number. Yeah. So the question of feeling what is the real impact, it's, it's a completely different story. But, but of course, again, since it's being covered more and more, mm -hmm. then Estonians feel now the sense of pride. OK, we were there helping to initiate that. But it's it's true, isn't it? That um, it is you, you know if you if you're sort of taken seriously outside, which of course is what this was all about. You know, the, the Baltic Way was all about the focus, as we were talking right at the beginning. Focus came onto your countries, you yeah. know, big time for the first time, you know, in in a big way. For sure. And actually, what I find interesting is that. Uh, there is no story about who started it. Mm -hmm. mm. Nobody's there's no one claim. hero. No, there's no, no there's one no. hero. Estonians came up with an idea yeah. or something. <laughs> Somehow, in this particular case, we are sharing this success experience, which I believe is what I think it identifies our nations a little bit, though. And you did. But and you did. If, if I could just add sure. to that, I think that 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 was the case for. Uh, the Baltic independence movements as a whole, that, that none of them generated sort of this leader who then afterwards became the, you know, the, the, the father of the nation who, the, who was, you know, <laughs> president for life or whatever like that. Basically, there were a lot of people who contributed, who were trusted, but most of them, with a few exceptions, but most of them left the political stage or after that. Or created all each or, their yeah, own party, yeah, which and, was and, the case and, for Estonia. And, well, and it continued in politics, but in any case, there, there, it wasn't like, you know, I don't know, a Napoleon or something like that who said, I've freed the nation and now I'm the father of the nation who will now continue right. to lead you on into the future. <laughs> Nothing like that happened, and I think that, that shows the degree to which it was really, it really was a popular movement, that the people who happened to be leading it were there almost by, not quite by happenstance, but, but they were there more or less just because they happened to be there and they were the ones fate had picked for, the, for these couple of years. 
And then they went on to do other things. And of course, it has influenced other yeah. countries too. Yeah. What happened there mm -hmm. too? I mean, um, you know, most ob well reported most widely was the Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, in the recent Hong Kong, and they actually did exactly the same thing, yeah. didn't they? Maybe you can just tell us very briefly about some of the, if you like, some of the um, the influence on other countries. It's a dem it was a democratic act, mm -hmm. also influenced um, Catalonia well, as well. Eastern Germany, I, with the, Eastern in, Germany. in the same uh, conference in Latvia on, on the 23rd of August, Angela Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel gave a video address where she recalled seeing these pictures and how impressed she was living in Eastern Germany at the time. And in fact, in Eastern Germany, they did something similar in 1990. They had, they, they had a chain that crossed the country, both east, west, and north, south, specifically in, uh, um, sort of because they had seen these pictures of the Baltic Way and they were so influenced by that. So it was that, and then afterwards in Taiwan, there was, a, there was a, something similar as well. So it, it, over the years, people keep returning to it and seeing it as a very strong symbol that they can refer to. So let's, um, just for the last few minutes, just talk about you know, what, what could possibly, if, I mean, you're the futurist, tell us, 30 years from now, could there ever be something like the Baltic Way again? So there is no one future, the only possible futures, right? We can predict with our current knowledge the perimeter, the possibility space where futures could happen and some things are more likely, some things are less likely. Um, I think what we're doing today um, as humanity, truly as a planetary civilization, not any one nation, um, we're making a choice. You know, are we heading towards a true paradigm shift in our values or are we heading towards mass extinction of species, including our own? So futures are exclusively radical. It's not more of the same. We are making a collective choice as humanity, and in that collective choice, what we need is the stories. What we need is the stories of people coming together, but we also do need the heroes, right? It's an important thing for us. We, you know, we connect, like why someone like Greta Thunberg, she's not the only one, and she should absolutely not be the only one. She should not be that one poster child because there are a lot of other you know, young people, especially indigenous young people, working towards that change. And yet, that's how we comprehend the stories. And so I think you know, if we tell more of the story and we tell more of this kind of story of coming together in a future tense, absolutely, things like that can happen. And they must happen, and they must happen not just physically, but also digitally. You know, and they need to be truly global. They need to be what sort of Cardi is doing, but they need to be across the fields. Cardi, Not I mean, just in the environmental sense, but also cultural sense, but also um, you know, political sense, etc. And what I feel, you know, my great wish today for the Baltic states is that as proud as we are you know, of each of our own country or of the Baltics at large, it is also very much how do we exist in the world, how we can be a place, because none of our countries is diverse truly enough because we were closed off for such a long time. And diversity is strength, diversity is power. And um, you know, one of the more inspiring things that I've seen recently is, is, a, is a little group of friends of mine that now established this exchange program between Lithuanian and Nigerian um, tech entrepreneurs and developers. You know, and, they, and they created a pipeline for people to get easier visa access and for Lithuanians to go and learn Nigeria and for um, Nigerians to get opportunities in Lithuania, right? And that is interesting. You know, instead of just collaborating with our immediate neighbors, seeing, well, where the talent is really at and how we can be the welcoming place for people that want to be the change, right? And those people are everywhere. You know, talent is equally distributed, opportunity isn't. And can we be a safe haven for people that don't just share our birthplace you know, or, or something outwardly similar, but can share a similar purpose. And for me, that would be the best heritage of the Baltic Way. I'm not going to leave the last word to, to the journalists. I'm going to go to Paul's first, and then I'm going to come back to you, because I, I don't think we should have the last word. But, but with great respect, Pauls, do you think that the Baltics should be working closer together? Do you think that this kind of ambition, which is huge, um, can, could the Baltics do more? Of course they could do more. I mean, there's no question about that. There's, I think that it's it, very true that we don't know very much about each other, despite the fact that we've 
done all these things together, uh, if you asked a typical Latvian, you know, what's the, uh, had they ever read a novel by an Estonian author? I think probably none of them have. I'm going to ask a Latvian, yeah. have you ever read a novel by an I have, Estonian I, author? I have read a novel by an <laughs> Estonian author. I have, but as, I think... As chair yeah, of the EBRD yes. Literature <laughs> Prize, I do need to know these things. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I certainly have. By uh, Tom Sare, I've, I've read a book by him, who's um, probably the most famous Estonian novelist of the previous generation. But um, <laughs> we, can name, we can name a few more. <laughs> but we'll but, do that. but the but the fact is that uh, I think most people haven't, and these are the kind of things that if uh, a friend of mine knows all three Baltic languages, that is considered to be com something completely extraordinary, almost impossible, right? That, mm -hmm. that there's a person who can speak both in Latvian, Estonian, and Lithuanian, or in all three, not in both, and so. Uh, I think that we can certainly learn more about each other, know more about each other, and this is something that, you know, for schools and for various exchange programs and so forth, so I think that definitely more can and be you, done. And you, as part of the, originally as part of the diaspora, um, you've been joined by many more people mm -hmm. who've come back, I don't know how yeah, we're going to yeah. describe, come back to, yeah, yeah. to the Baltic States. I mean, is that making a difference as well? I think it has made a difference in a lot of different ways. There was, there was actually a very interesting, and it's, uh, characteristic of all three countries, and uh, which is I think, one of the main goals of the Baltic Way was to rejoin the West and we've and so to open up the world as we've seen to, to for for both the people uh, the people who live there and for their children and grandchildren. And there was a period of about three or four months in 2007 when the presidents of all three states, Thomas Silvas, Vairavit Freiberger, and Valdas Adamkus, were all from the exile community and had come and had been elected president. And I think that really also demonstrates the degree to which this, that was in 2007, so basically 20 years after the Baltic Way, and that really demonstrates how really integral and strong this desire to rejoin and to build these bridges across to the, to the world from which the, these countries have been cut off for so long, how strong that desire was. Cardi, I'm, I'm going to leave the last word to you. Um, not just because I think the last few weeks, you know, we've been, obviously we've been all obsessed by our own political problems, but particularly the climate crisis is, is huge. And I think, you know, what, you've, what you're doing is quite remarkable and wonderful. What would you like to happen in the next 30 years? I mean, Estonia led the way in so many areas. I mean, all the Baltic states, I know, equally did other things. But I do remember particularly the... Um, the, the voting system, the electoral um, innovations, pioneering work that was done in Estonia. Is there something that Estonia can do in the next 30 years as really pioneering as far as your area is concerned? Absolutely. Um, before you had a question here, we are all small and is, does that identify us in some way? I think we are the most... Ad um, uh, our advantage is we are the smallest, which means that in the Countries such so small, we're able to pilot pretty much anything. Also piloting maybe the being the cleanest country in the world. I'm not saying we're in a good place right now politically, but anything is possible. We are so small. We can go digital overnight. We can go green overnight. And I suppose we could just say, being an optimist, because pretty much in this situation in the world, otherwise there's no point of getting out of the bed in the morning, really. So just... <laughs> always be happy and never satisfied, I think that could lead us to doing great things that the great world could um, be inspired by, because that's what I've seen. Um, the, most of the world won't pay attention how many people live there. It's a whole country that changed something. Nobody's going to go on Wikipedia about, you know, how, how, what's the population size or what's the real situation. It was a country, and we are so harmless because you didn't even hear us about us before, right? So you don't know whether we're white or something else. You have no clue, but it's a country and it gives people hope that it's possible to change the system. So um, still that, always happy, never satisfied. Uh, if we can't collaborate politically, there are so many subcultures and identity movements already that bring us together. The journalists are actually already united and the environmental activists are, are there and the communities are actually together. So. We have the power of uniting people on a completely new level. We are not nationalistic anymore. We are more about community. And I believe, at, as politics, like I said, we're triplets. We are 
we have ch children of the same family and if need be we'll come together and um, you know we can be great hosts also to the changes of the world. Great triplets here. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, now I'm just going to quickly check. We started quarter of an hour late, but I'm um, I'm just going to check with uh, the EBRD. Do we perhaps take the Q and A's and questions out to, out to the um, over a drink of wine or five ten minutes, five, ten minutes and, then and then wine? Right. So if we've got five to ten minutes, we have a few questions. We've got a microphone, and please put up your hand. And thank you, Linda, very much. And there you are. Thank you. Right. Uh, when Monica spoke about uh, the bleeding edge and cutting edge, uh, Can you hold it right in, up to your mouth. In uh, we're recording. technological Thank advances you. and how they influence politics, um, the name uh, Cambridge Analytica jumped in, in my brain up, <laughs> and I thought, um, you know, with populism, which I think uh, many uh, liberal-minded Europeans see as a big threat in Europe. Uh, do you think that um, liberal Europe is going to lose because um, populists and um, you know suspected that there's links, suspected links with organised crime, you know, they will have no Thank no yeah. um, compulsion using you know illegal ways of like with Cambridge Analytica to get mm -hmm. into the minds of people, you know, um, put garbage out through the social media. Uh, manipulate uh, voters in in, in Thank behaving. Thank you. Very, I'm so sorry because we're just going to. That's a yeah. brilliant question, and we're going to. Uh, I'm going to ask Monica if she um, briefly answer that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so targeted misinformation and warfare is the bleeding edge of warfare. Um, why it is so? What it's not codified, right? It's very hard to identify that this is a true adversary act of a foreign nation. Um, and what we're seeing today, the kind of targeted misinformation warfare and um, you know, truly um, data becoming um, an arm against our own best interests, um, it's nothing compared to where we're going. You know, right now, we exist within the screen-based format, and yet our democracies around the world and our humanitarian interests have been undermined. Right, from Brexit to the US election to weaponizing WhatsApp in the election of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil to you know, Rohingya massacre in Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, it is the bleeding edge. And within the existing format, now where we are going, obviously the emergence of the deep fakes and immersive media technology and being able to target people on a more and more individual level. You know, us not understanding these stakes is what's going to lead to our demise, right? And so the problem is not fake news. The problem is that fake news are like seeds that find the fertile ground to grow in. The only solution to that is raising the awareness. The only solution to that is reforming our educational systems so that critical, analytical, and creative thinking skills become our priority, right? Because if people are unable to pick from what is information and what is disinformation, how you know, it can serve the interests of the most adversary parties, there is no future to us, right? And deep fakes, I don't know how many of you have heard that thing, um, right? So, Imagine today, right, um, the kind of posts that were served during the late, latest sort of election cycles, um, you know, and how they were targeted towards each different person, um, and how it was then hard to track that back and to get that data. But where we're heading, especially with augmented reality glasses, virtual reality, is modifying the world just a little bit, changing things just so slightly that our awareness of the world changes. And there's like a very caricature version of that in, in a Black Mirror episode where, you know, in, in a certain warfare situation, some part of the population are starting to be seen as cockroaches, literally, right? And that's a caricature, but just slight adjustments here and there could lead us towards that. And I think this is one of the most pressing, you know, educational issues, political issues, and understanding how these technologies are shaping our future is truly crucial. And again, the only answer to that is a reforming of education, not just education for young people, but especially for the adults. Because who truly succumb the most towards that misinformation? It's the older people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? And look, we've got great examples of, of 
women, the predominance of women too, doing great things. And for you, it's obviously kind of normal that you're doing what we do. But my goodness, we've got so we fought so hard to get this, to this stage. So many of us now um, just take it for granted. But it's great to have you both here. Let's do. We had one, we had another question, and with the mic, there was a microphone, and I won't forget. Um, there was somebody just up there at the end. Could the speakers comment on the role of the? Russian minorities in each of their countries, because we haven't discussed that at all. Well, that, that wasn't sort of part of the Baltic Way discussion, <laughs> but I think it's an absolutely valid question. Um, maybe, would you mind very much if we just ask one speaker, um, not because I want to be discriminatory in any way at all, it's just that um, we've only got a few minutes Well, perhaps left. in Latvia, where the Russian minorities are okay. hardly a minority, it's almost pa half the population. But, but, um, so the, the three countries. And it is, it is an important question. Yes. So the, um, the, the, the role, if you like, or mm -hmm. where the Russian minority over fits the next 30 years. over the next 30 change, years. If they are going to change. No, very, very, very good question. You can see, deep sigh. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the next 30 years, that's a, that's a long time to think about this. I think what we're seeing uh, is that... Uh, well, if you look at young people, people who have been born after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the salience of this issue for most of them, I think, is decreasing. I see that among my children. I see that also among uh, Russophone uh, inhabitants of the Baltic states. I think that the divisive issues of history, if you look at surveys, of, for instance, of uh, young Russophone people in the Baltic, in Latvia in particular, that they, um, for instance, the question of the occupation is very vexed, especially for the older part of the population. Was Latvia occupied? Latvian speakers say yes, many but not all Russophones think that that's somehow a uh, not an accurate description of what happened at the, at the Second World War. That's why there were these, uh, what was mentioned, the, the, why, why we have these fireworks in Moscow now. But I think if you look at the younger generation, they are, they don't see that as that important. They live in a country that's independent, that they've lived in all their lives. And um, well, I Well, let's think, just quickly yeah, ask resident that, young yeah, people. Most, yeah, yeah, most is of them it, are making their way. Do you, do you see the, 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 the Russian population being different? I mean, you're all part of the same country. I mean, how, how do you view that question? Uh, I see completely that the politicians are completely stagnated in trying to deal with Russian minorities. And at the same time, interacting them with them on actual social issues, we have no problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Let's Do It campaign happened in 2008, I heard such great feedback from the Russian communities of saying that was the first time, and we had great Russian communication team, meaning that they were involved in the campaign just the same as Estonian-speaking population, saying that it was the first time we were able to express that we care about this community just as much as our Estonian-speaking um, community, sharing friends, people, citizens. And people all of a sudden, next to each other, side by side, realized, OK, it's not them and us, it's us all together. Mm -hmm. And I have definitely learned from that that uh, it's only just about finding that common language. Because politically, we can create such huge barriers that we don't I, as a person, wouldn't even know how a Russian minority has been discriminated mm -hmm. while I think that we're living in the same place. I think I will just leave it at that for the moment. And we can talk about it as we, um, as we go. But thank you very much for that question. Have we got time for one more? Or are we, or are we? I think we had a question down here. One more. Um, we just, Lindsay, if you wouldn't mind, with the microphone. Hi, thank you. It's, it's not so much a, a question to the panel, it's, it's more maybe a comment that maybe we could all take away and think about. Uh, and I suppose it, <coughs> excuse me, I suppose it relates to uh, what Monica was saying uh, just now, which I, I completely agree with. That's one of my hobby horses, that one. Um, but to bring it back to the Baltic Way, it might be worth thinking about in 1989, Tim Berners-Lee had just produced or effectively invented the World Wide Web, not the internet. That goes back to 1962 in a white mm -hmm. academic paper in the US. Um, and how rapidly things have changed. And I think there's a cultural lag. And I don't think we've caught up, exactly as Monica said, 
with how we, uh, certainly in the education system, how we, we are all responsible for making decisions. Um, I did actually go to Tim Berners-Lee's inaugural speech Gosh. at uh, the Royal Society. Well, if that can happen in 30 years ago, I wonder what's going to happen in the next well, 30 years. Exactly. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you um, very much to all of you. And before I wrap up here, do make sure that you all come out and join us and continue this conversation, which is, as always with these conversations, only just getting going. Um, but I would like to, th to thank the three embassies very much indeed and the three ambassadors so much for supporting this wonderful discussion and everybody who's worked so hard. You cannot imagine how much work goes into creating something like this and it's been a real Baltic way to get here um, and we've done it. I think we can all be very, very proud of what we've done and it's been wonderful meeting the three of you. So, Paul Svartsov, thank you so much. Mm. Monica Bilskete, thank, thank you so much. And thank you to Kadi Kenk. And I would like to say one thing, because you all sing. All you Baltics people sing. OK, so what we're going to do now, we're going to sing happy birthday to Kadi. It's her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kadi. Happy birthday to you. It's really wonderful that you've shared your birthday with us, and it's really, really great. Thanks for showing up. And, <laughs> and I'm sure there's a cake. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten the concert, because the whole idea of bringing music in at the very end is to mention that there's going to be a concert as well on November the 6th, and it is called The Chain of Freedom, Baltic Sounds um, in Focus. And it's going to be at Mark's Hamilton Terrace in Maida Vale. So if you want any information about that, we can talk about that outside. But I do want you to make sure that you've, take, you, uh, you've taken away some of the extraordinary things these remarkable people have been talking about. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do that.